I've kept my mouth shut for almost 50 years. Why the heck would I start talking now? Well, friends, a terminal cancer will do that to you. Stuff you thought that you would take to the grave suddenly becomes stuff you desperately want to tell someone. Anyone. I won't bore you with a long lament about my time in Vietnam. It was awful. It was awful for everyone involved. And it was really bad for me as I was 5'3". If you don't know what being particularly short during the Vietnam War entailed, well let me fill you in. You arrive in a country and a senior officer points at you and says, You would be a good fit for the tunnel commandos. Wanna join? Now technically it's a question as service in those platoons was voluntary. But it is sure as heck didn't feel like a question. It felt like an order. And so that was my burden for the war to be a tunnel rat. Climbing down into the deep, dank, dangerous tunnels filled with people and animals who wanted to kill me. Usually we operated in the huge Chu Chi tunnel complex near Saigon. But not on that day. On that day we were ordered to investigate a tunnel complex way up north. West of Da Nang. Two of us were sent into the tunnel that day, myself and Benoit. I was the first into the hole and Benoit followed. We both had our Model 39, some C4, our wits and not much else. If you're wondering why we carried the small caliber Model 39s, we'll go fire a Colt 45 in a narrow tunnel and come back to see me. The last guy who tried that got a ticket home with blood pouring out of his ears. We crawled for what felt like an age. The tunnel was a tight fit, which meant that it was probably freshly dug. It also stank of something foul, and that usually meant either spoiled food or some poor enemy soldier died down there and was left to rot. After about 40 minutes of crawling in total silence, I saw the tunnel ahead open into a room. I tapped Benoit on the head with my foot. I heard him ready his pistol. I climbed down into the open chamber pointing my pistol at the shadows. The room was dimly lit by a small oil lamp. It was also deserted. We took a moment to adjust. It was the longest single tunnel segment either of us had ever crawled through. It also had no traps which was unusual. Where was everybody who had dug the thing? Save for the lamp hanging from the roof and a canvas tarp on the opposite wall of the room was empty. I approached the tarp and used my pistol to move it aside. Behind the tarp was a stone staircase leading down. A stone staircase this far underground. I whispered to Benoit. VC didn't build this. This is old, very old. Older than American old. Benoit whispered back with fear in his voice. Now we've come this far and we have to keep going, I replied. We both walked slowly down the narrow staircase. Our flashlights had red lenses and I swear the illuminated staircase looked like we were descending into hell. The staircase was almost as deep as the tunnel was long. Finally, I saw the staircase blocked by another tarp and light was coming from the other side. I moved aside the tarp with my pistol. My finger trembled on the trigger. My eyes lit up, my heart raced, and I almost pulled the trigger, but I didn't. Something made me pause. The room had at least ten people in it, but none of them were armed. I pointed my pistol at the group and illuminated them with my flashlight. They didn't respond. They just stood there, rocking gently forward and back. Benoit, don't shoot. There's people in here, but there's something wrong with them. I stepped into the tiny room which was lit only by small candles. Benoit followed and we both shone our flashlights at the people. They paid no attention, but they continued to rock gently forward and back. I shone my flashlight in one of their faces. I clicked my fingers but she didn't respond. Her clothing told me that she was VC. They were all VC. Three women and seven men, all gently rocking forward and back not a care in the world. Their eyes were a solid color, which color I can't really say as I could only illuminate them with my red flashlight. 
Benoit motioned with his flashlight to the corner. Their rifles all sat in a pile and they were badly rusted. Jesus Christ, how long have these poor people been down here? I don't think Jesus Christ frequents this establishment, came Benoit's a terrified response. I shone my light to the front of the room. The VC were all facing a small altar and I walked towards it. On this simple stone plinth stood a gold statue illuminated by several candles. The statue was ornately crafted and it was a beautiful naked woman at the top half anyway. The bottom half was something like an octopus. Dozens of tiny gold tentacles had been meticulously crafted to woman's torso instead of legs. The statue had some writing at its base, a writing that I didn't recognize. I reached out to pick the statue up and to, to take a better look, but Benoit shouted, No, stop. Don't touch it. I retracted my hand about an inch from the statue. We need to leave this place, quickly. Benoit sat as he put his hand on my shoulder. Are we just going to leave them like this? I said as I shone my light in their eyes. We'll plant the C4 charges and put them on a 90 minute timer. He said, and he was already removing the C4 from a pouch on his belt. But they're unarmed. I implored, turning to Benoit. These people are dead, and maybe worse than dead. I saw something like this before, at home in the bayou. I didn't argue any longer, and we planted the C4 charges in a rush, set the timers for 90 minutes, and ran up the stone staircase as quickly as we could. It felt like a lifetime until we reached the small room with the lamp. I climbed into the tunnel and Benoit followed. Suddenly, we could hear a woman's voice faintly calling from far behind us. Ignore it. Keep moving. Benoit shouted from behind me. I didn't need to be told. I was not going back. It was the longest crawl of my life. I saw daylight and kept crawling even though my hands were raw and bloodied. I emerged into the light of day and gasped for fresh air. Benoit followed. We warned the others about the C4 charges but told them nothing else. Benoit and I sat in total silence away from the tunnel entrance, waiting and praying. The ground shook. A dull thud was heard and a spray of dirt had emerged from the tunnel. We both breathed a sigh of relief. It is only after an experience like that that you ask yourself the small questions. To this day, I still ask myself, who was keeping the candles lit in that room? I told you already that I wouldn't bore you with most of the details of my time in Vietnam. I also won't ever refer to it as Nam, as I found after returning home. It's the rear echelon who spent the war pencil pushing, who put on a husky voice and say, Nam, in some deep and mournful way. The short story is, after the incident in the tunnels west of Da Nang, Benoit and I were a little messed up, so we were useless for tunnel work. Both of us were transferred into separate regular platoons in the mechanized infantry. About a month after that, I was on a search and destroy mission when a rookie stepped over a VC tripwire. The tripwire was connected to one of our own captured claymores. The claymore blew the rookie's leg off and lodged a bunch of metal and bone fragments in the side of my torso. I survived and for my trouble, I got a ticket home. Well, I say home, but I really got a ticket to a military hospital called Camp Zama in Japan. And they managed to pull most of the bits of shrapnel out of my torso over two operations. The hospital was dangerously overcrowded. At night, the screaming of the other patients was horrendous, and the stench reminded me of that tunnel. I was actually happy when due to overcrowding, I was transferred to a much older building in the complex. It was some type of disused asylum ward, a total wreck. It only had maybe 15 patients, mostly guys with minor injuries. But I didn't care. It was far enough away from the main buildings that I didn't have to hear the poor guys screaming for their mothers every night. I was on the mend, which was a blessing and a curse. 
My tour wasn't up, and if I was declared fit to serve, I might be sent back to Vietnam. And I wasn't going back, not after what I saw in that tunnel. Two American military doctors and a female Japanese nurse arrived to assess my situation late one evening. Your injuries seem to be healing quite well, said one stern-faced doctor. Physically, at least, said the second doctor who wore narrow glasses. The first doctor gave him a look that could cut glass. The doctor wearing the glasses was clearly the psychiatrist. He would have to be my ticket home if I could convince him that I had lost my mind, but I couldn't overplay my hand. The nurse just stood behind them diligently taking notes. How was your emotional state? Have you had any troubling thoughts? I understand that you were a tunnel commando, probed the psychiatrist. Yeah, I, I sometimes have nightmares about the things that I saw in the tunnels. I sometimes think about harming myself. I put a quiver into my voice to add to the effect, but neither of them were buying it. I've never been a good liar. How messed up a situation was this that, after what I saw, I needed to fake being mentally unstable just to get a ticket home. I was despondent and I dropped the act. As much as I wanted to go home, I couldn't tell them about what had happened in the tunnels. I wanted to go home but not be thrown in a mental asylum. What kind of things did you see in the tunnels? The psychiatrist asked calmly. Doc, near Da Nang, I went down into the deepest, darkest tunnel that you can imagine. And if I told you what I saw in that tunnel, you wouldn't believe me anyway. So just write whatever you need on your clipboard and leave me be. The stern-faced doctor was unimpressed with my tone. But as I was speaking, the Japanese nurse stopped taking notes. Her face went deathly pale and she stared at me with a look of terror on her face. Well, while checking you again tomorrow, just try to get some rest, said the psychiatrist who had a curious look on his face. And with that, they all shuffled off. The nurse stared back at me as they went, her face still pale with fear. I went to sleep that night, knowing that soon they would send me back to Vietnam. I awoke late that night to the whispering voice of a woman. I couldn't hear where it was coming from, but I got out of bed and I walked uneasily, rolling my drip along with me. The woman's voice was coming from the next corridor. It must have been that nurse, I thought, but the voice sounded all too familiar. I wasn't going walking the halls without a weapon, so I searched the unmanned nurse's station. I found a scalpel in one of the drawers and knew what I have to do. I shuffled through the large wooden doors leading to the next corridor. The light bulbs flickered in the dimly lit corridor, and the paint was peeling off the walls. Far to the end, I could see the shape of a woman standing near a window looking out into the night. I shuffled toward her with the scalpel leading the way, rolling my drip with my left hand. As I approached, the faint whispers became louder and I could finally make out the words. Defiler. Come to the red house, it whispered. My drip caught in a cracked tile in the floor, making an awful clanking sound. The woman turned and moved quickly toward me. My heart raced in terror and I prepared the scalpel. You shouldn't be out of bed. It was the nurse, a lit cigarette in her hand. She must have been smoking by the window. Her English was near perfect. She must have been the daughter of an American GI. Many of them married Japanese women after the Second World War had ended. Why were you whispering to me? I asked, still pointing the scalpel. I wasn't whispering, she said confused and frightened. Yeah, you were. You called me a defiler. What does that mean? I demanded, my hand clutching the scalpel. Once again, her face took on the same pale and terrified look. The cigarette dropped from her hand. You're not safe here in Japan or back in Vietnam. They'll be looking for you. Her voice trembled as she spoke. Who? Who will be looking for me? I implored her. I don't know what they call themselves. 
Every place has a different name for them. The silent plague is the translation of what we call them here in Japan. All I know for certain is they'll be looking for you. Maybe you'll be safe if you get back to America. Her words offered a little comfort. You have to help me. You have to convince the doctors that I'm crazy. I said to her, almost begging. I'll try. Give me the scalpel, she said calmly. I handed her the scalpel and as quick as I had handed it to her, she slashed it across my arm. I roared out in pain and she dropped the scalpel and grabbed my hand putting pressure on the wound. This is the only way, she said. I instantly realized your plan. Two orderlies came rushing into the old corridor from an adjoining one, alerted by my screams. Hey, give me some bandages, he's trying to kill himself, she roared at the man. One of the orderlies ran for bandages and the other one ran over to support me. I slunk down into the orderly's arms, more from pageantry than blood loss. The wound wasn't that deep. I had suffered much worse before. She had done a good job. I was put back in bed and stitched up. The next night, I was visited by the psychiatrist. He was alone. He looked at me coldly and noted something on my chart and asked, have you been hearing voices or whispers? No, I replied quickly. It's funny. We had a young soldier from Louisiana in here about three weeks before you arrived. He was also a tunnel commando. He claimed that he was hearing whispers, but he could never tell me what they said. And we had to send the poor fellow home. The psychiatrist maintained his usual cold and clinical composure, but his eyes seemed to burn with a fanatic rage. If you did hear whispers and they told you something, a secret maybe, you would tell me, wouldn't you? I'm not hearing any voices or whispers. I responded with as much resolve as I could muster. The rage has slowly faded from his eyes. You're being transferred to a hospital in the U.S. You'll be assigned to a psychiatrist there, he said before pausing. I hope when you get home you'll find whatever it is in life that you're searching for. And with that, he smiled and walked away. He knew that I was lying to him. That very night, I was driven to the airport and pushed in a wheelchair into a C-130 by an MP. The flight was filled with men who were broken physically or mentally and most probably a few guys like me, just desperate not to go back to Vietnam. But unlike them, I was actually hearing voices, but I wasn't crazy. The flight took off and I breathed a sigh of relief. I removed my dog tags, praying that I would never need them again. I opened the zipper on my bag to put the dog tags inside. And there staring back at me was a small, crudely made, clay replica of the golden statue that I had seen in the tunnels. So, what happens when you got home? I hear you ask. Well, for a while very little, I was kept in the hospital for about three weeks. The new psychiatrist seemed to swamped with work and saw that I wasn't really a danger to myself or others and so I was discharged. I tried finding Benoit as soon as I could, but he had gone off the grid as they might say these days. But in truth, disappearing back then was as simple as not listing your name in the phone book. Despite living in the guy's pocket for eight months of my life, I knew very little about him. I knew that he was a couple of hours west of New Orleans, and that he had a sister named Marie. Not exactly solid facts to track a man down by. Soon, I gave up trying. I just decided to try and forget about everything. Vietnam, the tunnel, the woman's voice. But the statue was always there as a constant reminder. I kept it wrapped in cloth, afraid to touch the thing. Eventually, I did what everybody else did in New York when they wanted to get rid of something. I threw it in the East River. He would find good company down there with all the discharged mob weapons and photos of ex-girlfriends. I had a small amount of money coming in for my veteran disability payments, and I topped this up by working odd jobs when I could find the work that is. New York in 1969 wasn't exactly a fun place to be. 
The city stank from uncollected garbage and there seemed to be a strike or a riot about every other day. First, the teachers, the sanitation workers, and went on and on. I lived down near Greenwich Village, so I was right in the middle of the mess. Crime was also a huge problem and I rarely left the apartment without my pistol. And that's how it went for about six months. I worked a little and I tried to avoid getting shot or stabbed. But then one night, out of the blue, the phone rang. I generally only got calls from cold call companies. It was a relatively new thing back then and every person with a phone was trying to sell their crap. I picked up the phone. I don't want to buy radiators, life insurance, or mortgage protection. So go screw yourself. I calmly said and there was a tiny pause. It's Philippe Benoit. I see you haven't lost your way with words, came the response. Jesus, I tried tracking you down when I got back. Couldn't find a trace of you. Where have you been? In New Orleans. Look, I don't want to say too much over the phone, but I received a very strange package in the mail. Turns out someone was able to track me down. My heart sank with the news. I didn't need to ask what was in the package, I could only guess. Can you come down to New Orleans? I could offer you work and a place to crash if you need it. And do you have anything pressing keeping you in New York? I looked out the window as I listened to Benoit on the phone. Two NYPD officers were beating the ever-loving crap out of some guys with batons. A small group nearby were raining bottles at them. Yeah, I could do with getting out of New York for a while. I could be there in a few days, I replied. And Benoit filled me in on the details of where to meet. He didn't want to talk on the phone as if he thought somebody might be listening. The next morning, I threw a little possessions that I had into my old beaten up Impala and I hit the road. I didn't bother giving notice to the landlord of my flea bag apartment. You might think me mad for taking the trip to New Orleans. I suppose that I could have just hung up the phone and forgot about Benoit and the things that we saw, but that's just not me. He needed my help and we had been through it together in Vietnam and I didn't mean that figuratively. I mean I felt that we had literally descended into some kind of hell in that tunnel. I wasn't about to leave the guy to deal with that stuff alone. It felt good to get out of New York and the journey was long and the summer was sweltering. I drove relentlessly wanting to get to New Orleans as quickly as possible. I avoided the big cities and only stopped to sleep. On the last night of the journey, I stopped at a cheap motel near a one-horse town about an hour past Birmingham. The reception building was small and the desk was manned by a middle-aged man. I guessed he was the owner on account of there being a photo of him in uniform as a younger man on the wall. It looked like it was taken somewhere in Europe during the Second World War. Hey, you look a little worse for wear. Long journey, where are you headed to? The owner made small talk as he handed me my key. Houston, I lied as I fumbled with my things. I'm not fully sure why I lied. It's not like whoever these people with the statues were, they could manage to staff every crappy hotel between New York and New Orleans with staff, on and off the chance that I passed through. I was so exhausted that night that I fell asleep fully clothed as soon as my head hit the pillow. I awoke in a sweat to the whispers of a woman. It was still night out and I took my pistol from my bag and tucked it into the back of my jeans. I left the room and I followed the voice. The same phrase over and over. Defiler, come to the red house. I walked down the steps to ground level. The voice became louder as I approached a soda machine at the corner of the motel. A light on top glowed red in the night. Defiler, almost like it was inside my head. I'm not a defiler. I mumbled back to no one. What was that, honey? You want to defile me? Well, that's going to cost you. Usually my customers don't put that in kind of eloquent language. She laughed. It was a woman of the night, a well-dressed one at that, a little too well-dressed and refined for this motel. She was leaning near the illuminated soda machine. Sorry, I was talking to myself. I replied, the whispers had stopped. 
You looking for a date? She casually inquired. Ah, uh, no, I'm fine, thanks. Just came to get a soda. I quickly responded. You sure? It's a long way to New Orleans. I could help you relax. She said, licking her lips. My mind froze with fear, but I kept my composure. I'm headed to Houston. I calmly responded. Funny, the owner said you were on your way to New Orleans. She dryly retorted. Oh, well, the owner's mistaken. I replied, matching her tone. Well, that's what I told him when he said that you were headed to Houston. It took some of my charm to persuade him, but he finally told me that you had a map that showed a route to New Orleans when you checked in. I said nothing in response. Sadly, what he couldn't tell me was where you were headed once you got to New Orleans. Yeah, well, maybe your charm isn't as persuasive as you think, I responded. All the while, I was considering taking on my pistol and putting it to her head. As she tilted her head forward a little, her face glowed a fiery red under the light of the soda machine. She bared her teeth and her eyes took on the same look of fanatic rage that I had seen in the psychiatrist's eyes at the hospital. Oh, you have no idea how persuasive I can be. She spat with unrestrained rage. I reached for my pistol, but she slipped around the corner and ran into the black of the night. I hope you find whatever it is you're looking for, she said, laughing from somewhere deep in the darkness. Running out after her into the night would be a fool's errand. I ran in a panic to the motel reception building. Maybe she had divulged some tiny pieces of information to the owner. I could be persuasive too. Broken ribs usually jogged people's memory. Maybe he wouldn't have any information. But either way, I was going to sternly educate him on the perils of spilling your guts to strange women who offer you free blowies. The small reception building was dimly lit, and there was no one behind the desk. I rang the bell but got no response. Impatiently, I walked behind the counter and I opened the back office door. As I opened the door, the metallic smell of fresh blood hit my nostrils. I covered my nose. The owner lay dead on his back. His mouth was duct taped shut. Two glass shards had been rammed into his eye sockets. A tough guy. I didn't give him enough credit. He wasn't falling for her routine. So she had to torture him for what little information that he had. Or maybe it was to just send a message. I wasn't going to wait around for the cops. Maybe this was a setup and either way I wasn't sticking around. I wiped down the office doorknob with my sleeve. My fingerprints being anywhere else in the building could be explained but not in the back office door. I walked to my room with as much outward calm as I could muster. I packed my things and I got in my car. I drove out into the night. With luck, I would make it to New Orleans by morning. I knew one thing for certain. These people, whoever they were, wanted that voice to keep whispering to me. They wanted to know where it was leading me. That was the only reason that I was still alive. As soon as they figured that it might be less trouble to torture me rather than just follow me, I would end up like the owner of the motel. The pistol was digging into my back, so I took it from my jeans and opened the glove compartment to put it inside. As the glove compartment opened, a small clay statuette fell out. I didn't need to look at it. I already knew what it was. I put the pistol away and I kept driving. Safety in numbers, I thought, as I sped towards New Orleans. Benoit would have a plan. He always did. I barreled my way through the night, praying the engine of my old Impala wouldn't give up the ghost from the hard ride. A day was breaking as I crossed Lake Pontchartrain. It glowed at yellow with the rising sun, but in truth, it was a cesspool brown the closer that I got to the city. Benoit had just told me to get to the French Quarter and call a phone number when I got there. The French Quarter wasn't quite the tourist mecca that it is today, but it was still popular, especially with service members on shore leave looking for cheap thrills, and it was seedy. But a city like that can be a blessing in disguise for men in my situation. Seedy cities are easy to disappear in if needed, and there's usually some unscrupulous ex-service member willing to sell you some extra firepower. In 
and who was I to judge an unscrupulous man? I had just fled a murder scene. I parked the car near a payphone and got out. I fumbled with some change and dialed the number that Benoit had given me. The phone rang for what felt like a lifetime, but then somebody picked up. It's me, I'm here. I said not giving any other details. It's good to hear your voice. I thought something might have happened to you on the road. Came Benoit's relieved response. Yeah, well something did happen to me on the road. I'll fill you in when I see you. I replied while looking around the street through the dirty glass. Benoit gave me an address a couple of blocks away. He didn't say anything else over the phone. I drove the car over to the address and it was on a quiet side street. When I arrived at the address, I thought that I must have been mistaken. It was a small weird store, not an apartment building. Marie's General Goods and Supplies Strangest general goods store that I had ever seen. Black drapes covered the windows and there wasn't much sign of life. I pushed the door with apprehension. A small bell rang and I was hit by the smell of burning herbs. I walked into the store and was filled with antiques as what I would refer to as voodoo stuff. Although I never quite grasped the difference between hoodoo, voodoo, and all those other African religions. You made it. Benoit emerged from behind the counter with a look of relief on his face. He walked over and hugged me, beating his hand to my back so firmly that it knocked the air out of my lungs a little bit. Uh, take it easy, you'll break a rib. I said laughing a little. Uh, sorry, it's just good to see ya. He replied, releasing me. You hadn't called in a few days and I thought that you might not make it. I almost didn't. Something happened to me while I was on the road, I replied. I wanted to fill Benoit and all the details of my trip, but I was more perplexed by the shop that we were standing in. And Marie's, who owns this place, your sister? I inquired, puzzled. It was my grandmother's. My sister is named after her. She died just after we were shipped out to Vietnam. My sister looked after the place while I was away. Almost as soon as I was home, she moved to LA. She has a notion to become a singer. My grandmother left her some money and I got the creepy shop. Benoit said while sweeping his arm across the selection of weird merchandise in the shop. Can people buy this stuff? I said pointing at an odd selection of herbs. Yeah, business is good. The shop is kind of discreet, so the tourists think they found some genuine secret voodoo shop. Oh, don't worry, 95% of the stuff is completely harmless. Benoit said smiling. And the other 5%? I skeptically inquired. Yeah, that stuff's not for tourists. I keep those items in the back storeroom, along with an item that I got in the mail. Speaking of which, what happened to you on the road? Benoit walked over to the door and locked it. I filled Benoit in on the hospital in Japan, the statuette and the woman at the motel. The only details that I left out was the murder of the motel owner in the whispers. I didn't want to freak him out or involve him in a murder that I might get accused of. And Benoit listened, looking concerned. I got the same statuette in the mail. It was sent to my old address, so I don't know how long it had been there probably since I got back from war. There's no way to know for sure, it had no postmark. Once I got it, I called you straight away. I got worried about the statuette, so I checked all the books here in the shop to see if any of them had any details on the statue or the woman in it, but I turned up nothing. Benoit continued. I was stumped, so I called the University of Baton Rouge and they pointed me in the direction of a retired professor some expert in ancient religions. And so I paid him a visit. He lives about an hour from here in the middle of nowhere. Nice house, but the land is practically a swamp. And did he recognize the statue? I asked on tenterhooks. Uh, kinda. He said it wasn't really African or American. The statuette is a crude modern replica, but the woman depicted was probably the silent mother. 
Some ancient god people worshipped in coastal communities the world over. But her religion probably died away at least a millennia ago. Apparently, she can grant her followers eternal bliss if they worship at her temple. Trouble is, nobody knows where her temple is. According to the professor, it probably doesn't exist. He told me to give him a couple of days to do some more research. Yeah, those people in the tunnel sure didn't look like they found eternal bliss. Then again, it didn't look like a temple either, just a small shrine. I mused. And did he get back to you? And that was a couple of days ago. I rang him all morning, but he's not answering the phone. Benoit responded. Ah, oh, crap. We gotta drive over there now and bring a weapon, I said putting on my jacket. Shouldn't we just give him another day? Benoit said perplexed. He may not have another day, Benoit. I said as we walked out the door, he locked it behind him, setting the sign to closed. We drove out of the city to the west in Benoit's car, and it was sweltering. In the tunnel in Vietnam, I thought you said that you had seen something like that before. I probed Benoit. While I was embellishing a little. Look, when I was 14, a local counselor was accused of some pretty serious stuff. Several local women made some serious allegations about the guy. But he was white and powerful and so was able to buy his way out of trouble. But the locals, they weren't satisfied with the outcome. One night my grandmother drove me out to the middle of the nowhere to a sort of ceremony. My memory of the event is kind of hazy. There were lots of people chanting and there was this voodoo priest. They forced the counselor to drink this weird liquid. The counselor's eyes took on a kind of dead look, like the lights were on but nobody was home. After that, the counselor responded to the shaman's every command. Walk, smile, jump. He was like a puppet. And then they just released him and off he wandered into the night. The cops eventually found him and brought him home. According to newspaper reports, he seemed fine, if a little confused. He certainly didn't talk about any ceremony. A couple of days later, according to the same reports, he got a phone call at home. After the call, his wife saw him. He calmly walked into the kitchen, he picked up a knife, and he stabbed himself in the throat. Jesus, fun story, Benoit, way to lighten the mood. I said with the mental image in my head. So yeah, I didn't see exactly what we saw in the tunnels before, but I have seen some weirdly similar stuff. Benoit said as he pressed on harder on the accelerator. We both sat in silence as he drove. After about an hour of driving, we turned off the small road onto an even smaller dirt track. Reeds grew high at the side of the road. The guy really did live in a swamp. Only a mile or so now. Benoit informed me as we bounced uncomfortably over the dirt road. As soon as he spoke, we saw a small column of smoke rising in the distance. Tell me that's not his house, I said half hoping. His house is the only one on this road. Benoit replied with fear in his voice as we approached. The dirt track turned to gravel as we approached. It was a small old plantation house. When I say small, it was as small as a plantation house would go, but still imposing and it was also very much ablaze. Thick plumes of black smoke were bellowing from the house, but the fire had not fully engulfed it. The fire had clearly been started recently. The car came to a halt on the grass lawn and we both hopped out. Benoit ran to the front porch and there was a barrel of rainwater near a gutter pipe. He dunked his head into it, drenching himself. He pulled his soaked t-shirt up over his mouth and nose. Are you kidding me? We're not going in there, I roared. I'm not leaving the guy to burn to death. I got him into this mess. Benoit replied, his voice muffled by the t-shirt. I hesitated for a second and then following Benoit's lead, I dunked my head into the barrel. We both stood at the doorway, our faces covered or ready to enter. This isn't going to end well, I thought as Benoit kicked in the door. The heat was incredible, smoke was filling the house and luckily those old houses had pretty high ceilings. The smoke sat like an ominous black blanket above our heads. 
Soon it would fill the house and our lungs if we weren't careful. Benoit led the way. His study is in the back, that's where he works. Benoit shouted through his t-shirt. We made our way quickly to the study. Benoit felt the door to check if it was hot. It's warm, keep to the side. Benoit said as he quickly kicked the door and then ducked to the left of the door frame. Luckily, there was no backdraft. The room was ablaze, but it hadn't burned up all the oxygen. Flames engulfed the ceiling and licked the walls. And then we spotted him. The professor lay dead in his chair, head slumped on his large wooden desk, a pool of blood pouring from his throat, and two shards of glass protruding from his eye sockets. Flames licked the walls and the quilt of smoke rolled in thick black waves above our heads. Benoit and I stood over the body of the professor. We couldn't see each other's faces, but terror quickly showed in Benoit's eyes. Check the drawers, I'll check his pockets, he ordered. What about Prince? I said in a panic. Are you kidding me? In five minutes there won't even be a body, let alone Prince. Benoit screamed. Realizing my stupidity, I began to rifle through the desk drawers as Benoit took the uninviable task of checking the dead guy's pockets. The entire building was a sea of sound as we worked. The fire roared and the building groaned under its own weight. Rubbings, I said as I produced several thin sheets of paper from the desk drawer. I could barely make out the words with the smoke, but I saw the word, Silent Mother. For those of you young enough not to remember, this was how people used to copy stuff before everybody had copy machines in their house. Heck, maybe some of you are even young enough you barely know what a copy machine is. Benoit's eyes lit up at the sight of the papers. We need to get out of here. Benoit didn't answer and the house gave out an unmerciful groan like a death rattle. It was doing the talking now and neither of us needed to be told twice. We both sprinted for the front door as the roof beams began to collapse. We sprinted straight to the car. I took one glance back at the house and it was almost engulfed. The roof sagged and collapsed in on itself as I hopped into the car. Benoit was already behind the wheel. The engine roared to life and we left a spray of mud and gravel as we tore off the lawn and down the driveway. The car bounced along the dirt track and we made it back to the main road in double time. The house a raging inferno behind us. The rubbings. Benoit inquired. I pulled them out from my pocket and examined them, scanning for anything that might be relevant. I could barely read the copied writing, my eyes still stinging with smoke, but several blocks of text had been underlined with a red pen. I turned the papers over on the back were some handwritten notes. I read one note aloud. P.S. Mr. Benoit, it's worth pointing out that your statuette did appear to be hollow. Did you consider breaking it open? Perhaps you hadn't noticed as you seemed afraid to touch it. I assure you that it's perfectly safe from a historical point of view, as it's a cheap modern replica. As to your question about the Red House, please see my other notes. The Red House? I questioned Benoit as he drove. Look, I didn't want to freak you out, but I had been hearing voices telling me to go to the Red House, Benoit explained. I already knew that you had been hearing voices, Benoit. That creep of a psychiatrist told me at Camp Zama. I just didn't know you were hearing the exact same voice as me. No more secrets from here on out, I said angrily. All right, no more secrets from here on out. Oh, that nice motel owner that I told you about. He was actually murdered in a similar fashion to our professor friend back there. I said waiting for the backlash. Are you kidding me? You're yelling at me about secrets and you had a murder hidden under your hat. Benoit spat back at me with anger. All right, all right, we both agreed. No more secrets. I said while feigning reading the notes through my smoke burnt eyes. We sat the rest of the journey in silence. We arrived back at the shop looking awful. Benoit unlocked the door and we shuffled inside. He made for the back room and I followed behind. The back room was large enough and it also had a restroom. 
I took the rubbings out of my pocket and put them aside on a desk for safety. We took turns splashing cold water into our burning red eyes, letting out sounds of relief as we did it. After a few minutes, I slumped down at a pillar exhausted. Benoit dried his hands and face and then threw the towel to me as he sat down at the desk to examine the papers. Benoit began to read aloud the underlined segments. The followers of the Silent Mother believed that she could offer them eternal bliss if they found her temple and released the Silent Plague. The chosen few who followed her would then control this world in her name. The unbelievers would be empty husks ready to be commanded, their souls captured for torment by the Silent Mother. Yeah, that sounds all too familiar, I said. Benoit nodded thoughtfully as he skipped to another passage. The Silent Mother's temple, it is claimed, could only be found by locating three golden shrines to the Silent Mother, dotted around the globe. These shrines themselves were claimed to hold some weaker power over mortals, and could enslave unbelievers foolish enough to touch them, which the Silent Mother would entice them to do. Those who resisted the urge to touch the shrine would be rewarded with a part of the location of her temple. It must be noted at this point that these shrines and the temple are believed by all reliable sources to be purely mythological. The only dissenting voice in this fact was a talented medical student named Arthur Blake, who traveled extensively in Northern Europe and East Africa, studying the folklore in those regions during the mid-1930s. He claimed in a paper for a historical journal that he had found two of the shrines and learned that the temple lay near a city by the sea fought over by all the great powers, and he strongly believed that city was New Orleans. He refused to give any evidence by that city rather than many other cities that could match the given description. Suffice to say his paper was roundly ridiculed for its vagueness. The many pointing out that no civilization spanned the diverse geographical areas that he claimed to have found the shrines. Nor did it account for the fact that these stories of the Silent Mother's Temple go back more than a thousand years and no great powers fought over New Orleans until the 18th century. The student quickly retracted his paper, stating that while traveling for scholastic reasons, he had partaken in local rituals that involved psychedelics. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Benoit inquired, his hands shaking. Yeah, you've been living somewhere near a haunted temple your entire life, I replied. No, you idiot. That psychiatrist in Camp Zama, Benoit said pointing at the papers. Oh yeah, no wonder he's got such a hard on for us. He had been searching for that third shrine most of his life, and we blew it up. Benoit began to read another one of the professor's handwritten notes. Although I was skeptical, I rang the Louisiana Historical Society, and there is a building that was once referred to as the Red House. It was an infamous brothel built in the bayou when New Orleans was first settled. The building had been abandoned since the 1920s, but has not been demolished as it is a protected historical structure. He has an address written here, Benoit said looking over at me. That detail wasn't copied from a book, so maybe our psychiatrist and his lady friend don't know the location yet. Unless they had managed to torture the information out of the professor, I suggested. Why kill the professor and burn the house unless they already had all the information they needed? Otherwise, they still needed us to find the temple. Benoit replied. Maybe he lied to them or they just got sloppy. Heck. Maybe we interrupted them when we had arrived, I argued. And we have to assume that they either already know where the temple is, or they're going to follow us if we go looking for it, Benoit said concerned. As we both pondered the subject, I spotted the statuette on a shelf. I picked it up with a towel, wrapped it in a ball, and smacked it against the top of the desk. I heard it shatter into pieces, and this startled Benoit a little. God, you could have warned me first. He scolded me as I opened the towel, pouring the broken contents onto the desk. The broken contents emerged along with a small handwritten note. If you find the temple, destroy it. Don't let the followers of the Silent Mother release the plague. You've already destroyed one of her shrines. 
finish the work and release the souls that she torments. I guess more than one group has been following us, I said confused. All right, screw this. We go to the temple and destroy it. But I'm not going to that temple without some serious firepower. Benoit said with resolve in his voice. Do you know a guy? I inquired. Oh yeah, I know a guy. Benoit replied, pushing aside a storage closet to reveal a small door. Benoit opened the hidden door and we both entered into a small dark room. He reached up and pulled a cord. A flickering, incandescent bulb suddenly illuminated what could only be described as an Aladdin's cave of armaments. Jesus, Benoit, when you said you knew a guy, I said stopping as I marveled at the treasure trove. Yeah, well, remember when I said the business was good? Well, this is the real business, Benoit informed me. I picked up and began inspecting an AK-47 style rifle from a collection leaning against the wall. Those are mostly AKMs, but there are a few Type 56s mixed in there as well, he explained. I'm just disappointed you don't buy American, I said laughing. Yeah, well, what can I say? Communists make reliable rifles. Although, if you must insist, I do have something big, black and all American if you want to see it. Benoit said smirking. Christ, I think I've already seen enough of that in the showers at boot camp, Benoit. I said with a look of disdain. Benoit pulled the zipper open on a large kit bag on a table in the corner revealing a large black M60 machine gun. And don't you think maybe that's overkill? Hauling it around might be a problem for little guys like us. What about ammo? I argued. Ammo isn't the issue, that's easy to source. The disintegrating belts that feed it are the problem. I only have one 50 round belt. Benoit informed me. No, we need to be able to move fast. It will only slow us down, I suggested. Yeah, good point. All right, we'll leave it here. Benoit replied, stuffing two AKM rifles and four fully loaded magazines into a second empty kit bag. I took a single claymore that was sitting on a shelf looking lonely and put it into the bag along with the rifles. A claymore, Benoit said surprised. Yeah, if we get there before them, I would like to know when they arrive. I replied, smiling. Makes sense. He agreed while placing some C4 and detonators into the bag. We all set? He said, zipping the bag shut. Looks like it, I replied. And we both put on our jackets and checked our flashlights. I carried the bag and Benoit turned off the light and pushed the storage closet back into position, hiding the doorway to the small arsenal. We made our way to the front door and Benoit looked out onto the quiet street to see if the coast was clear. We're good to go, he said, as we both emerged. I loaded the bag into the trunk. Between all the time we had spent reading the professor's notes and making up our makeshift arsenal, it was sundown by the time that we left the city. I was driving at Benoit's insistence. He said that we were much less likely to be stopped by the cops with a white guy behind the wheel. The steering felt sluggish with the heavy cargo on the trunk. I drove slowly so as to not attract any unwanted attention. I had a guess, looking at the map, the address seemed to be about an hour or so from the city, but it was deep into the swamp. We had to take a selection of back roads and by roads to get to our destination. Night was falling when we turned into a small dirt road raised up from the water. Either side of the road was swampland. We drove on the road for a couple of miles. In the distance, a large building began to appear. The Red House was, as the name suggested, red. It seemed to be made of sandstone. It sat on a small islet in the swamp connected to the raised road. It was a grand old building that looked more like a small fort that could have been lifted straight out of Paris or Saigon. As we got closer, it became obvious that the building was in a serious state of disrepair. But frankly, it was a miracle that it was still standing in a swamp after all these years. I wondered if some unnatural power kept a structure like this standing in such an area. But I put the thought out of my mind and focused on the task at hand. It looks like we got here first, Benoit pondered, surveying the grounds as we approached. 
there were no other vehicles visible. Yeah, unless they arrived by boat, I suggested. The house was sat on the water and might have a jetty at the rear. It was hard to tell. The grounds were overgrown and we hid the car in a patch of overgrown reeds on the lawn. Benoit opened the trunk and I unzipped the bag and removed the two AKM rifles. I loaded a magazine into each and slung one rifle onto my shoulder and handed the other to Benoit. I stuffed the claymore into my large jacket pocket and we each took a spare magazine. The bag was now empty save for the C4 and the detonators. Benoit zipped up the bag and slung it over his shoulder. We both walked up to the imposing building, weighed down with our armaments, and ascended the stone steps. The large wooden doors gave little resistance as I pushed them. We turned on the flashlights attached to our jackets as we entered a small lobby area with a coat room. I'm surprised junkies haven't taken this place over, I said to Benoit. People down south are afraid of buildings like this man. Too many ghosts of the past. They stay well clear, he responded. We walked through the lobby area to a corridor. The air was hot and smelled of mold. The old wallpaper was falling off the walls and bits of broken glass and other detritus littered the old, baggy red carpet. At the end of the long corridor, we reached more large double doors. Opening them, we emerged into what looked like an auditorium. The room had a high ceiling and was laid out like a theater with a stage and lots of booths and tables. The galleries had lots of private boxes. The place was all adorned with badly worn red velvet drapes. I guess the place was converted into one of those classy burlesque shows, I suggested. Yeah, it must have been a pretty swanky place in its heyday. I'm willing to bet rich folk and officers only. I can't imagine grunts like us would have been welcome in a place like this. Benoit responded, Where the heck do we go now? This doesn't look much like a temple. I wondered out loud. And then the familiar whispering voice began to speak. Welcome to Filers, I've been expecting you. Benoit looked at me in fear and I could tell that we were hearing the same voice and not just because she spoke in plural. The voice no longer seemed to be in our heads, it, it was emanating from behind the stage. We ran up and mounted the stage. The voice continued to whisper but became louder. I put my rifle to my shoulder and pulled the charging handle. I parted the tattered stage curtain with the barrel of my rifle. The area was illuminated with our flashlights. We walked slowly through the backstage area as I darted the barrel of my rifle left and right in nothing but shadows. The voice whispered from below us. The floor was covered with an old rug. I pulled it aside to reveal the cellar hatch with a metal pole ring handle. I pulled the handle with one hand and the other tightly pressed the rifle on my shoulder. We were hit with a foul smell like rotting flesh. Look, whatever we see or hear down here, we just ignore it. We plant the charges and we get out as quickly as possible. Benoit said, fear planted on his face. I just nodded as we started to descend the narrow stone staircase. I suddenly remembered the claymore in my pocket. We paused as I took it from my pocket and I placed it on the top step, pointing towards the hatch. I pulled the hatch down and attached the tripwire to the handle on the inside of the hatch. We continued down the narrow stone staircase and it looked all too familiar, like we were descending the same stone staircase from the tunnel in Vietnam. It seemed to go on forever. I led the way with my rifle and it was hot, sweat dripped from my face and the smell of decay became overpowering. The stairwell ahead stopped at a corner and turned to wood. We rounded the corner and the wood was ornately carved like in a cathedral. We had clearly found our temple. The wooden corridor ended in an archway and we emerged into what looked like a small wooden chapel. The chapel was lit by wall torches and did a high vaulted ceiling. The entire structure was made of ornately carved wood. Only some unnatural power could keep this structure intact, like this under a swamp. Even the foul smell subsided when we had entered the chapel. The chapel was filled with wooden church pews and paintings adorned the walls in perfect condition. Benoit and I stared in silence, 
the paintings depicted the woman from the statuette. In one, she was smiling while handing bread to some children. In a second, she was comforting a sick bedridden woman. In the third, she was protecting a group of peasants from soldiers in armor. At the front of the chapel, there was a large statue of the woman, but it was in gold. It was a simple wooden carving of the woman smiling. Aside from her legs being made of tentacles, she seemed warm and inviting. A small wooden box lay at her feet. The voice spoke. Oh, welcome to my temple, lost souls. You defiled one of my shrines. That shrine was a beacon to protect the weak and oppressed. Vulnerable souls will suffer because of your sacrilege. Her voice was warm and reassuring. But all is not lost. You have found my temple and can repent for your sacrilege. You must help me feed the hungry, tend the sick, and restore the lame. Man, that's a lot of stuff and neither of us are doctors. I replied like a scolded five-year-old. And I don't know anything about farming to grow food. Benoit told her in an equally ridiculous fashion. Fear not, children. Simply open the box at my feet and read the prayer within. and My love will spread throughout the world. It will fill the stomachs of the hungry, heal the wounds of the sick, and soothe the minds of those in disrepair. The voice said in a reassuring mother's tone. I approached the box at her feet. Benoit followed me. I reached out to open the lid with joy in my heart. An explosion shook the chapel. The claymore at the foot of the staircase had clearly been detonated. I was disoriented for a second with the sound and shaking, just long enough to see the world as it really was. I retracted my hand. Benoit stepped back in fear looking around the chapel. In this place, it's not right. Benoit's voice was filled with terror. I know. Plant the charges, I responded. Before my eyes, the wooden statue turned to solid gold and the expression of warm comfort on the woman's face had turned to malice. The ornately carved wooden pillars of the chapel turned to bone and the paintings now depicted scenes of horror. In one, the woman hovered over an army of men with hollow eyes. In another, she stood before a temple made of human remains. The chapel pews turned to stone and were no longer empty. They were filled with the skeletal remains of people all sitting upright, staring at the statue in adoration. The foul stench of something evil returned to my nostrils. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? I said with barely contained horror. Yes, cover the door. Benoit screamed as he began planting the C4 behind the pillars. I could hear screaming from above us, and then two gunshots and the screaming stopped. They had obviously put whoever had been hit by the claymore out of their misery. They clearly meant business. I could hear the footsteps of a large group of people descending the stone stairs from above. And that sounds like a lot of people. I knew that we should have brought the M60. Benoit said in a hushed but angry tone. Stop crying over spilled milk and plant those charges. I said back, wishing that we had the M60. I hunkered down behind one of these stone pews with the AKM trains and the archway entrance, which I can now see was made of stone and human bones. I reverted into the mode of a trained soldier, my hands steadied on the weapon and my breathing slowed as I could hear the footsteps draw closer. A man entered the room pointing his rifle uneasily. He looked untrained, he certainly wasn't a mercenary, maybe a fanatic. I didn't fire on him immediately, hoping that his friends would join him. Two more men entered. The third man clearly had some training as he quickly spotted me hunkered behind the stone pew and raised his rifle. I fired three quick single shots, cutting each of them down. No more men entered, but I could hear people in the corridor whispering. No grenades, you could damage the temple. I heard a woman whisper in order. I recognized her voice. It was the lady from the motel. Benoit ducked over and hunkered down beside me at the stone pew. Alright, charges are set. Ten minutes. He said, pointing his rifle at the doorway. I prayed it would be long enough. I'm coming in. I'm unarmed. Don't shoot. I just want to talk. Came a man's voice. Okay, we can talk, I replied. 
It was the psychiatrist from Camp Zama. He walked in with his palms open to show that he wasn't carrying any weapons. Thank you for leading us here. That old professor sent us on a wild goose chase. But we had some of our people tailing you as a precaution. I never imagined it would be this beautiful. He remarked in awe, looking up at the ceiling. We let him talk, but we knew that we were on the clock. It's just as I had heard in the stories, a temple made of solid gold. He said while running his finger on a pillar near the entranceway. The pillar was made of stone and human femur bones. Benoit gave me a sideways look. I guess the silent mother promised different people different things. Two soldiers wary of war shown a perfect peaceful world, while the power hungry are shown a temple of gold and promises of infinite power. This is the true gift of the silent mother. She can grant infinite wealth and power to rule over the world. She can even restore her followers to life if they sacrifice themselves in her name. As he spoke, his eyes took on the same fanatic rage that I had seen before in the hospital. Yes, mother, not much time, I understand. He mumbled to himself. Then suddenly he screamed like a banshee and ran towards us with what seemed like inhuman speed. The others, waiting in the stairwell, flooded into the room and began spraying fire. I spotted three men and the woman from the motel in the chaos. We quickly cut the psychiatrist down, but the others seemed to be imbued with the same fanaticism. The silent mother was whispering to them all, and who knows what she was promising them. They were like animals advancing on us from behind the stone pews. Bullets snapped as they hit the pews that we were hunkered behind. The two of the men tried to advance too quickly, and Benoit put them down with a quick burst of automatic fire. I leaned out from the side of the pew and fired a quick shot at the crown of a head that I could see poking up from behind another pew. A body slumped into the aisle. The woman had been flanking us and appeared at the side of our pew firing. A bullet snapped past my head, and then she was hit by a volley of automatic fire that cut into her legs. I turned to see Benoit's rifle smoke emerging from the barrel. He ran over and kicked the pistol from her hand. We gotta get out of here, we don't have much time, Benoit said, slinging the rifle over his shoulder. We were ready to leave when we heard the woman crawling along the ground. She was still alive and dragging herself by her fingernails towards the statue. And we looked down at her and she was moving at a miserable pace, dragging herself inch by inch to the statue. It was still a distance away from her and the attempt seemed worthless. Please, silent mother, please. I sought out one of your shrines, I did what you asked. She pleaded, barely able to breathe, crawling slowly, leaving a snake of blood as her trail. Please, do as you promised, restore my child's life. Please, silent mother, I beg you, I beg you. She screamed with all her remaining strength through gritted teeth, crawling toward the statue. I pointed my rifle and I shot her dead. We both ran toward the exit without speaking. The silent mother called to me while I ran, and I assumed she did the same to Benoit. We ignored her, perhaps her power was more effective on those who were desperate enough to believe her lies. We bounded up the stone staircase, and the clock was against us. We reached the top of the staircase, the top of the step, and the hatch had been blown away by the claymore. I crawled out over the rubble, and Benoit followed. We sprinted through the auditorium, the ground shook and a loud thud rattled the building. It began to groan angrily, its foundations clearly shaken up by the blast. As we sprinted through the corridor, the building began to list dangerously. The dang thing was falling into the swamp. We burst out of the front doors of the lobby, down the steps and onto the lawn. From the safety of the lawn, we looked back at the red house. It was sinking on one corner backward into the swamp. And then suddenly as if a support pillar had collapsed, half the building broke off and fell into the swamp. The rest soon followed as we looked on in silence. After that night, I never heard the whispers of the silent mother again. But I often thought of the desperation of that woman and what the silent mother had promised her.